A 9-0 loss to the Cubs made it official. This would be the ninth 100-loss season in franchise history. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday morning if you're into football and or hockey. Hope you can check out my daily shots of Steelers and Penguins right where you found this. I've got nothing, nothing good to say about 100 losses. I don't have excuses to offer. I don't care what the circumstances were, how the games were managed, meaning prioritizing development and seeing what we've got in so-and-so. When you lose 100 games... And you've only done that now nine times in 135 years. That's bad. That's not something that anyone at any level of the organization should think is okay. Yes, I'm aware of what Ben Charrington's trying to do. Yes, I'm in favor, enthusiastically so of what Charrington's trying to do. Yes, I was very, very much aware this season was not going to go well from the WL standpoint. That didn't exactly require some supernatural prognostication skills, you know? Everyone saw a bad season coming. But as I spoke way back before spring training, it's very hard to lose 100 games. History tells us that. What we're seeing in Major League Baseball across the board this season shows us that in the sense that, yes, there are four teams now with 100 losses, but that's also freakishly high. It's abnormal. So while I'm okay with certain components of what happened in Pittsburgh This summer, notably, Brian Reynolds' breakout, David Bednar's maturation, uh, Brian Hayes' continuing maturation around some injuries, the general defense and fundamentals, which were grossly distorted to the outside, but were actually quite good for anybody who was watching the team on a regular basis, and, you know, part of the fact that they rank fourth in the majors in fielding percentage. There have been some positives. But to beat the dead horse here, there weren't enough. There weren't enough. Not enough players got better. There's that terminology again. That comes from Charrington. That's the edict. That's what he wants to see in Pittsburgh. He wants to see that when players arrive, whether they're older, whether they're younger, that they get better. And I'll go a step higher on the ladder. I know every time you mention Bob Nutting's name, it's like, ah, Bob Nutting, ah. But sticking within the prism of the fact that he owns the baseball team still, when he put this front office into place and he fired everyone, after the 2019 season, his own top stated priority was to ensure that players would get better in Pittsburgh and not just when they left Pittsburgh, the way we'd been seeing Garrett Cole, Charlie Morton, Tyler Glass now. list goes on. And I didn't see it. I didn't see it. You know who else didn't see it? Charrington. You know how I know that? They fired Rick Eckstein, the hitting coach, the guy who was responsible for the people who went up there to swing bats in Pittsburgh. And they can justify it however they want. Uh, He didn't fit with our broader philosophy we're looking forward to bringing in. That just means they have somebody handpicked and ready to go. Somebody who will fit in with what they and their analytics people and everything else feels is the right guy. Bottom line, didn't get better. Didn't get better. 
the one player who got better offensively on the entire roster was Reynolds. And even then, you can argue that Reynolds was just a continuation of 2019 and that what happened to him in the weird two-month season in 2020 was the aberration. Did Reynolds get better or did Reynolds just remember who he was? I can say the same thing for the pitchers. I've been asking this question for a couple of weeks now. Who's gotten better? Who's gotten better? Bednar was the pitcher of the year. Bednar was the pitcher of the year for the Pirates in 2021, according to a vote of the Pittsburgh chapter of the Baseball Writers Association, of which I'm a member and which I cast a vote for Bednar myself. But listen to what we're saying here, you know? (laughs) Did Bednar get better? Sure. He developed a curve that he hadn't really utilized much beforehand. And I'll give Oscar Marine some credit for that because you have to, because it's happening under his watch. Who else? Who else got better? Who else got better on this team? Where did it happen? The manager can't escape blame for that either. I love the fact that Shelton has instituted, enforced, and really just made his number one task the installation of fundamentals and a culture of fundamentals. And I've loved watching that play out on the diamond because for everything else that was going to go wrong for this team, they were at least going to do the right things and make the right choices. For the most part, obviously with a couple hideous exceptions that ended up making all kinds of headlines, they did that. But the manager can't escape blame for the hitters not getting better, for the pitchers not getting better, for the team not getting better. This probably should have been, if some players got better, not a 100-loss season. 90, maybe? And is that really splitting hairs? What's the difference between a 90-loss season and a 100-loss season? To me, there's a difference. Not in the standings, of course, not, you know, aesthetics and whatever. People are going to say they stink one way or the other because both of those records would stink. But, but, you'd have seen more players get better. So this season has no silver lining to it by hitting those 100 losses. Shelton came into his post-game interview last night after the game very clearly prepared for questions about 100 losses and he didn't exactly elaborate when it initially came up. Yeah, I mean, it's not good, especially as hard as we worked. We just have to keep moving forward. I get that. I, I can't blame the guy for answering the way he did, for handling it the way he has, because he's hearing from above. Look, just use Kyle Keller Use Nick Mears in tough game situations. He's hearing that. And he's got to do that. For now. For now. This team has to understand that there can't be a sequel. And I'm not talking about 100 losses or 90 losses. There can't be a sequel. This is Pittsburgh. This isn't. St. Petersburg, Florida, where nobody's even paying attention to the team. This is Pittsburgh. You can't do this in perpetuity while you're waiting for prospects to advance. Significant progress has to be made in 2022. Not in Greensboro, not in Bradenton, not in Altoona, not in Indianapolis. Right here. Right here at PNC Park. When we come back, just one question. back. It's time for Just One Question. That's brought to you always on this program by our friends at the North Shore Tavern, directly across Federal Street from PNC Park, home to Steak on a Stone, home to all kinds of other great chef-prepared food. Don't let the term tavern fool you. This isn't just a bar, although they have a spectacular bar setting. 
not to mention access to all of the 500 beers on tap right next door at Mike's Beer Bar, which is owned also by Mike Sukic. North Shore Tavern is a great, great place to eat in addition to everything else that it brings. Check it out right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Our J1Q comes from Michael Schaefer, who asks, should O'Neill Cruz be playing for the Pirates for this final weekend, given what he's done in Indianapolis? You know, I usually answer no to these kinds of things because there's roster considerations, there's uh, how long a player can have his rights retained into the future based on arbitration and other variables. But yeah, yeah, if you brought up Rowanzi Contreras to pitch three innings the other night to make his debut, to get that out of the way, and Contreras, by comparison, really didn't do much. I mean, he did early on with Altoona, but then he got hurt. He was out for a couple of months. He came back and he had two four-inning starts for Indianapolis and then was called up. So it was more of a nod to him than it was anything that he'd really earned. Cruz, on the other hand, is just murdering the baseball. He's got home runs in four consecutive games. He's only been in Indy for six games. He's got five homers, and he's 11 for 21. Last night in the game against Nashville, they walked him three times. They wanted no part of him. I mean, that's the ultimate compliment. They were terrified of him. They wanted nothing to do with him. Indy's not playing for anything. There's no playoff drive, playoff push. They're a sub-500 team in the International League. Bring them up. One weekend. One weekend. Show them the ballpark. Get your first major league hit out of the way. Do it in a less pressure-packed setting than what might be presented to him next year. And believe me, there can't be a less pressured pack setting than PNC Park these days. Yeah, let them know. We saw you, kid. We saw what you did. We appreciate it. We saw Contreras. We brought him up. We saw you. And we're bringing you up. Welcome to town. Here's where your locker's going to be. Here, go play shortstop for that matter. You know, that's another seemingly endless debate. When it comes to Cruz, where is he going to play? Where is he going to play? First of all, it doesn't matter. When you have a bat like that and you're effortlessly poking home runs out of ballparks the way he has for a while now, and I mean poke, when I say poking, I mean poking because he doesn't even very often get all of his swing into a pitch. When he does, you really know because we're talking close to 500 feet. But he has just poked some home runs. Let him poke one out here this weekend. Fan appreciation night on Saturday. Fireworks and everything. Might actually be some humans there. Why not? Why not? What does it mess up contractually? You know what? Deal with it some other day. Deal with it some other day. Because as I got into in the opening segment... And combining that with what I got into on yesterday's show here, every day that Brian Reynolds is playing for your baseball team is a day that you should be surrounding him with talent. That's your timetable. Everyone talks about timetable. What's a timetable? That's the timetable. Reynolds is here now. Reynolds is here for four more years. What do you want to do? Waste another one? You want to lose another 100? You want to lose another 95? Or do you want to start making some serious steps? These steps do not have to come at the expense of your system. They don't even have to come at the expense, I believe, of future payrolls. There's a way to do this in an intelligent, affordable way that allows you to continue to, if this is in fact what the pirates are doing, and if you believe them, that's your choice. Set aside money for whenever you are going to move payroll back up to where it was. 
in 2015 and 2016 when it topped out at 109 million. There's no reason not to be there at some point. Have to be there at some point. The Pirates' payroll commitment for the 2022 season, I kid you not, is zero dollars and zero cents. Now, I can get more technical than that about which players they already have hold their rights to and have X amount of dollars committed to, whatever. But in terms of actual contracts, major league signed contracts, it is zero dollars and zero cents. Even paying Reynolds his first year of arbitration, however it is that that plays out, whatever, is barely going to put a dent in a significant payroll. If you took payroll next year from 58 this year to, I don't know, 70, you could actually add an awful lot to the roster. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you could. You can do that. How did I get on this tangent here? Bring up O'Neill Cruz. I'm totally with my guy here. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. Let's do this again Monday when we can start getting into the offseason. And yes, by the way, Daily Shot of Pirates will continue nonstop. That's kind of how this thing goes. 